All right. Sweet presence in here this morning. Is in there? Why don't we uh, stand on our feet as we welcome uh, John Greenwald to the platform this morning. He's a wise guy right here. Thank you, John. Thank you. You can go ahead and be seated. Uh, you know, every now and then you just you get even to before the person gets up to speak and you think, you know, if we went home now, I'd, I'd have had the value I needed today. And today was one of those days, so you're dismissed. So, <laughs> not quite. Stay. Just a little bit longer. Uh, I really enjoyed the worship today. That was great. And I was, I was thinking the same thing that Pastor Nate was. It was taking me back. The songs were and the presence was. And you're just like, you don't get this at home. You can, but I feel sorry for all the people that left church during COVID and didn't come back. You know, it's like, do you guys realize what you're missing? Uh, you guys do. Uh, but a lot of people don't. They just left it behind and thought, I can do life without all that. But, boy, you, you can't replace corporate worship, can you? So anyhow, preaching to the choir there for sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Always uh, love being here. Uh, beyond church, you know, I was thinking while everything else was going on that I probably have about three places in the United States that I, I kind of call home, you know, when I go there. And this is one of them. You know, I know some of your team and some of the people here are a little better than I do in some places. And so you get here and there's familiar faces and you go, yeah, this is nice. So thank you guys for that. It's great to be here. So this morning, I want to speak about something that I believe can help anybody become better at both evangelism and discipleship, and something that can make you better in all of your relationships. Anybody interested? Yes. Good, okay, hold that thought. So I want to back up a few years. When I was a teenager, and this is before I was saved yet, I got saved at 17, the week after I graduated from high school. And so as a teenager, you know, and you're, you're starting to get interested in girls and you want to go out on dates, I was semi-terrified of that whole scenario. And the reason was is I didn't know what to say when I was out on a date or something. So I just, most of the time, I just didn't even ask anybody out because I didn't want to have that situation. I mean, just thinking about it gave me knots in my stomach. And you were sweating because now some people have never had that issue, right? I mean, they can go out with anybody, be anywhere, and talk with anyone. Well, I was not that way. So maybe for some of you this morning, this means absolutely nothing. But uh, it, was so, it was something that I had to grow out of. And, and so, you know, in the earlier part of my life, any time there was a situation with meeting people, I felt the same way. Well, you can't really go through life very well like that. Now, I didn't hide at home uh, or stay away from things, but it did affect me. Now, you stick me out in the woods or the wilderness, and I'm at home, right? Put me in a city with people, and I feel awkward. You know, we have had the great advantage and experience of, I've been in almost every major city in Europe, and sometimes that's people's dreams, not my dream. I could care less if I ever went to any of those places. Now, I go there, I always did it because of work, not because it was something that I really looked forward to doing. You know, here's the guy who his dream was to move to Alaska after high school and build a cabin out on 160 acres because the government was still giving you that at that point in time if you'd build something on it. Well, I got saved and, you know, I, and God ruined all my dreams. <laughs> I have often thought about writing a small book about God ruins dreams. <laughs> well, he does, doesn't he? Now, does he replace them with something better? 100%. But uh, all the dreams that I had, he ruined. And uh, you're like, God? I mean, so that whole thing about, you know, Lord, have your way in me. If you want to do your own thing, don't ever say that kind of stuff. Because <laughs> it just won't work very well. But, you know, so for me as a younger Christian, too, the, the prayer of consecration was absolutely vital for me because, you know, I had never grown up that way. I wasn't geared toward, you know, have your way in me and not my will, but your will. It's like, oh, that was hard, too. But um, 
Now, I might sound like I really struggled growing up, but it really, I had a great time. So, but anyhow, when it came to people, that's where I struggled. Now, this, um, this last summer, uh, I got to do something that I had wanted to do for a very long time. I'll pull all this together. Um, I had always wanted to do a longer through hike. And a through hike, you know, isn't just, you know, like where you park the car in a place and you go hike up and you hike back. Now, this is where, you know, it's a longer one. So my oldest son and I decided to do the Colorado Trail, which goes from Denver to Durango, and it's just under 500 miles. And uh, now I know that's not everybody's dream also. <laughs> Some people are like, no way. And I'd, I'd tell people then, they go, where did you sleep? It's like, well, when you're out there, you don't get hotels every night. You, know? you sleep in a tent and you backpack it all with you. So, you know, I didn't want to wait any longer. I'm not getting younger. So, I, you know, it's something that you wish you had done when you were in your 20s and maybe 30s, but you don't want to wait till you're in your 60s, but that's what I did because I could never find enough time to do that, right, where I had the kind of place and team and everything where I could do that. But about a year before that, I told Michelle, I said, next year I'm going to do that hike even if I do it myself. And uh, she's like, eh, I don't really want you doing it by yourself. And I said, I know, but I can. There's other people out there. It's not like you're 100% alone. And uh, so I had a couple of reasons for wanting to do that. Well, anyhow, our oldest son ended up coming, and I don't know if that's if he wanted to or the rest of the family made him. I'm not sure. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we got 400 and some miles out of there, and the weather was so nasty. I mean, we'd had so much sleet and hail and... I mean, just sideways blowing on us because we, the last part of that, we were up between 12 and 13,000 feet a lot. And this is from, this is in the middle of August now. And, it's, and the weather was just beating us up. And it was the kind of weather that when you were up above tree line for so long that you couldn't stop. You had to keep walking or you better push the SOS button on your GPS because you, you couldn't even feel your hands. So... Uh, you know, you, you just kept walking until you could find a place to go down. Now, some people go, why would you do that? Well, that's part of the reason, because it's a challenge, yeah. right? But so I had a couple of reasons for doing that. One was I just always wanted to do one of those longer through hikes. And, and as far as through hikes go, that's a short one, by the way. Uh, but I wanted to do it. I wanted to unplug. You know, how many years have I been sitting there with my computer every day, doing stuff and uh, that kind of thing. And I just thought, what would it be like to unplug for 30 days or so and just see what that's like with my mind? And then also, I wanted a chance to dream a little bit. So uh, when I went out on that hike, you know, there, I, I did it and I, I asked God some questions about some things that I wanted maybe some insight on. And I had been thinking about... Uh, you know, what about the next couple of years, Lord? You know, I just, what do, how do we want to do this? What do you want to see happen? And, uh, you know, so I'm going to give you some answers to what he said to me, and, but these, this took weeks. You know, it wasn't like I just said it and there was a word. It was kind of took time to get what it all was like. And really what he did for us at the time, or for me at the time, was he never answered that question, but he asked me another question. And he said, what would you like the next 20 years to look like? Well, I'm 66. And he asked me, what would you like the next 20 years to look like? As far as I know, he's never asked me a question like that before. It was always more, Lord, what do you want us, what do you want us to do? And there was always something to do. There's an assignment. We've really lived our life guided by an assignment. And so... You know, he's like, what do you want the next 20 years to look like? And I'm like, you're actually asking me that question? And so it gave me time during that hike to, to think about that and what I wanted the next 20 years to look like. Well, I won't share all that part with you, but what I'm talking about today is how can we be better at evangelism, discipleship, relationships, and it's really the transforming power of learning how to ask the right questions. And you used to go, well, is that even in the Bible? Yeah, it is actually. It's like a lot of the other truths that are there. It's, it's everywhere. 
If you look through the Gospels, Jesus, you know, I don't know how many of these were duplicates because of the Gospels, but he asked over 300 questions. That's a lot of questions that he was asking through there. So uh, anybody can get better at this. And uh, it was certainly something that I had to do because as a very timid introvert, I had to learn how to talk to people. And the way I did that was by learning how to ask questions. And, and everybody can ask questions. And we can get better at it as we go along. I, it's one of the things that really helped change my life. And I'm still growing in it. I hate it when I am done with a conversation, either online or in person, driving away, or you're done and you go, oh, wait a minute, that's what I should have asked. How many of you have done that? We all have, right? Here's what I should have said, or here's what I should have asked. And so probably for the last 20 years, I've been really making a concerted effort on not walking away with that thought to where I've maybe thought ahead of time, uh, about the questions I ask. Like when I go into a meeting today, I spend more time on my preparation on the questions I'm going to ask than anything else I do. And you find out when you do that, that there's not as much preparation in other areas that you need. And I'll come back to that thought too probably. So uh, I think that we all have people in our life that we either we come across regularly or just every now and then uh, that we want to be able to help lead them to Christ or help them better in their walk with Christ and maybe we haven't known what to say. And so I just want to challenge you with this thought. Don't worry about sometimes so much to say. Think about something to ask. And that might change your approach to that person. And when somebody asks you a question, it's often better than a statement. Let me, uh, I wrote this down a while back. Questions instead of opinions will make you more likable without compromising your views and beliefs. Boy, if you, if you turn on anything today, everybody's sharing their opinions. <laughs> How many would, of you would agree that most opinions are uninformed? Yeah. Or their opinions are given before enough questions were asked? We've all done that too. You know, what we learned in marriage counseling over the years was never form an opinion no matter what anybody said because it was his side, her side, and then the truth. Okay? And, and that goes with almost any situation. So how do we find out more? We find out by asking more questions. Um, <clears throat> so we want to watch how strong our opinions are. I read this quote recently too. It said, asking questions is the first way to begin change. The man who asks a question is, is a fool for a minute. The man who does not ask is a fool for life. The first step to receiving an answer is being brave enough to ask a question. You know, if I'd never asked Michelle to marry me, we probably wouldn't be married. Now, to my surprise, she actually said yes. She probably should have regretted that once or twice over the years, but it's like, what was I thinking? Should have said no. <laughs> uh, turn to Matthew chapter 16 today. We're going to just look at how Jesus, the great master teacher, how he used questions. There's two things that we really see. Well, there's more than two, but let me just mention two. Two things we really see about Jesus and why he was so effective. One was his ability to ask questions, great questions, and two, great stories. All right? So uh, let's go. I'm reading this out of NLT, starting in verse 13. And it says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, is or am? Son of man, is. why is it? That sounds like bad English there, doesn't it? Um, and uh, that's, that was a question. So they said, well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Were they right? No. So far, they didn't have the right uh, answer. Did he correct them? No. He just asked another question. 
Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Right? One was, what's everybody out there saying? And number two was, all the people that were close to him, who do you say that I am? So one was just more for information. And the second question was, he wanted to see if they had done the math and if any transformation had happened in their life. Right? He's digging down a little deeper now. And, of course, um, we know then that Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He got that one right, didn't he? And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father in heaven. And he says, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So Jesus asked his disciples questions and, you know, we can see that all the way through the Gospels. No matter what the situation was, he was often asking questions. Now, he asked questions that sometimes we wouldn't like today. How about when they were out in one of their boat experiences? Mark chapter 4, you know, starting in verse 35 to 41. Uh, he said, you know, we're going to go to the other side. He goes, falls asleep in the boat, in the, in the back side of the boat. The storm comes up so much so that the guys that are used to boats think they're going to die. And uh, they came back and they asked the question, said, Master, don't you care that we're going to perish? And what, he didn't answer that. He just got up. You know, he was asked like 183 questions and he answered three. And you think, well, that's not very good leadership. <laughs> Pastor never answers my questions. Well, maybe he just asks you one so you can self-discover. Uh, but it kind of cracks me up, you know, that uh, he just hardly ever answered them directly. So, but what did he say then? Well, it's, he, it said he rebuked the storm, said, peace be still. He calmed a whole storm with a few words. And then he said, how is it possible that you have no faith? Oh, that would go over big today. How would you like to be sitting with somebody and you say something, they go, how is it possible you don't have any faith? Well, what kind of friend are you talking to me like that? Yeah, we don't like questions like that sometimes, but when it comes to discipleship, we should. Michelle and I made, one of the agreements we made when we were getting married was that we would never let those kinds of things slide. You know, if a bad confession came out of one of our mouths, you know, if I'd heard her say it, you'd sit there and you don't get mad or anything. You just say, uh, would you like me to agree with you in Jesus' name on that? <laughs> no. I didn't think so. Well, then I would get it too sometimes. You know, what it did is it, it certainly caused us to watch our tongue with each other, but we, we made an agreement that we would never get upset about that. We would be thankful for it, that somebody was there to help us. You know, and that's one of the things, you know, if you're going to have a spouse or a partner, like that, that should be part of the deal. Don't be afraid of that. I mean, if you're going to walk on eggshells with each other about that kind of stuff, ugh. nobody wants that. That's not the kind of relationship you want, so you might want to work on getting over that. Uh, so anyhow... Uh, Jesus had a lot of great things that he, he said with them. Um, so in this particular case in Matthew chapter 16, you know, he, is, he asked a few questions and through observation, revelation, this declaration was made and it, that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. And after that was said, then he declared what he was going to do for the next 2,000 years. And that was, I will build my church. Which for us is like, why are we on the earth? Why are we breathing? It was that very reason. But he didn't just come along and say and make this big declaration. It came about because he asked questions. To see if it was, if it was bubbling up, if people had done the math. I mean, these were the guys closest to him. He knew, he knew that they knew some of the Old Testament scriptures. And he, here's the one that had been prophesied about for thousands of years. And had they put that together from what they'd seen and heard? Well, you know, it would be great to hear the back conversation of the disciples, wouldn't it? 
you know, what were they saying as it went along? And they're like, do you think it could be him? You know, and then when the time came, Peter just blurts it out. And you're thinking, oh my God, if you got that one wrong, could you imagine saying that and it'd be wrong? You just kind of, you'd, you'd eat that one forever. I mean, they would have, the, the other disciples would have been ribbing him about that forever. <laughs> so, um, instead of just declaring what the most, one of the most important things he ever said, he, he asked some questions and that's how it came to the surface. So I think that's good, that's good for us because there's a lot of things that I think we want to reveal, but it's almost better if we ask some questions and see if people have done the math to where it's almost where they have the revelation of it before you have to say it. It doesn't always work that way, and there's nothing wrong with declaring some things. But um, I think that it was important there that he did it the way he did. I do believe that, you know, with Jesus, and it should be with anybody in when you're asking questions, that you don't just want to teach somebody, but you want to ask the kind of questions to see if they can discover it, right? Where they have to think. Uh, a lot of our teaching in the world today is one person talks and everybody listens. Now on a Sunday morning, that makes sense because of the size of things, right? But in, in the rest of time, in the rest of life, um, you know, hopefully with our families, with our kids, that we are learning how to ask the kind of questions that can help transform their life. Yes. Now, kids are different, and I'll come back to that one because I want to give some stories about that. Let's, let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. We know that asking questions engages the listener and requires that they listen closer and think. There's a lot of people out there today spewing opinions that you can tell they haven't thought. And you're just like, oh my God, I can't believe you're willing to open your mouth and say that because you're like that far under the surface of what's really going on. Ask more questions and get down further. So um, let's see what, about what God did with questions. I Googled the other day and said, how many question marks are there in the Bible? And it said there's something like 3,297 question marks. So I don't know how that relates all of it to the kind of questions we're talking about, but it's a lot of, that's a lot of question marks. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 through 13, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called out to Adam and said, where are you? <laughs> Do you think God knew where he was? Yeah. And yet he still asked. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And I mean, if you're going to be naked, the one thing you don't have to be worried about is God. He's seen everything, right? So, I mean, like, really, you're going to hide from him when you're naked? What? He's the only one you don't mind seeing you that way. Um, then the, I, I know there was other things there. Then the man said, the woman who you gave uh, to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? So, again, he didn't chastise, but he asked a question. So, even God asks questions. He is all-knowing. And yet he asks questions. There's a good chance you know more than your kids. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't still ask questions. Um, so in, in this, when Jesus said, I will build my church, I think, again, that this is really, that is the greatest commission that we have been given in the, as a body of Christ. Now, then in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 20, we know that's where he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? And then in Matthew 28, he says, go into all nations and make disciples. So I would say the twofold aspect of building the church is evangelism and discipleship, and we want to be good at that, right? And so one way that we can be a little gooder than we are today is by asking questions. It's a simple thing but yet difficult to always find the right questions. 
So I think it's something we should practice that. Um, I think that, it, that if we will learn to be better at asking questions, that we will see a big difference in both evangelism and discipleship and our relationships. Um, I'm going to give you four places that I think we should ask questions. Number one, we should ask questions to ourselves. Number two, we must ask questions to others. Number three, I'm going to put this in our work and church atmosphere. We must ask our team questions. And then number four, we must ask God questions. Nothing wrong with asking your leader questions either. That's, that's legit. So uh, first one, we must ask ourselves questions. Why is asking ourselves questions a good idea? Well, uh, it might cause ourselves to think. Brings up new thoughts and ideas. Um, it's funny how that works sometimes. If you'll just stop and ask yourself a question about something, the ideas and the thoughts that will come. Um, it gives us something to ponder. And pondering is good when it comes to things. It, it leads to self-discovery. And this is vital in everybody's life. That's a big deal. Um, if Let's say that we have something in, that in another person's life that we're around that bothers us. What can we do about that? We might ask the question, Lord, and to yourself, why does this bother me? Because you might discover that it's more about you than it is them. I don't like that when that happens, but it does. That's what happens with asking questions too. Sometimes the finger is right back there. So it's good to ask, why does this bother me? And is it fixable? And what can I do then to help this situation or be a better person? So, you know, part of what this does is, you know, in, in the Apostle Paul's writings, the, the, the great thread that went all through his writings was spiritual growth. He said a lot of different things, but spiritual growth was one of them. And why? Because spiritual growth cures almost every problem we have. That's why we keep growing. And, some, and one of the ways to grow is to ask ourselves questions. I don't know about you, but I don't like getting stuck. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want to have a, a habit that's going along that, that makes me feel like I'm stuck and I'm not getting out of it. I, I don't like it when I'm not growing. That's frustrating to me. I don't like it when the church isn't growing. And I don't just mean the numbers, but I mean where the people aren't growing and growing up. Uh, that, that frustrates me. And so sometimes I ask, why does that frustrate me? <laughs> well, some of it's just time. Things take longer than we want, right? That doesn't mean people aren't growing, but it always seems to take longer. That's true in my own life. That's what frustrates me about me is how long it takes to grow. Um, but let me say this. It's better sometimes if we are asking ourselves questions than to wait for somebody else to ask them. Nothing wrong if they do, even though we know what risks come with that. Um, some questions that we should all ask ourselves is, who am I? As a believer, there is an answer to that that is more vital than anything the world will ever tell us. But if we haven't answered that question, who am I? Who am I in Christ? Who am I in the body of Christ? In other words, God, what is it you have for me to do? Specifically, you know, those are questions that we, we should be asking ourselves, especially if we're younger and haven't figured all that out yet. Um, what am I supposed to do in life? Uh, what did I just learn from this? What should I have learned from it? How can I help someone? You know, some, some days I do this on purpose. I just, I think... Lord, who could I encourage today? How could I help someone today? 
And these things won't maybe take long. It might be a text, phone call. And every now and then you just, you say that and you go, seems like I should go see them. But you, sometimes it doesn't happen if you don't ask the question. Um, how can I help the people under me? If you're in an organization, how can I help the people over me? What will that take? Um, so, uh, sometimes that's all it takes is us asking a question to bring something up that we otherwise wouldn't have thought about or wouldn't have caused some change in this like, like it needs to happen. Um, we had, um, you know, I work with a lot of our the directors around the world today and especially in, in our region, which is Europe, Africa, Middle East. And I, I should give you a quick update on that too, that... Um, I just got back from Germany two weeks ago again, and um, you're glad you're not buying gas there. It was $10 a gallon. Boy, that, that thing on the tank, on the, or on the gas thing was going so fast, I thought we were going to have a problem, even digitally. It's like, whoa. Yeah, but it was, over, it was like two thirty-five dollars a liter. So just multiply, you got a little bit of an exchange rate, and then you got times about four. So yeah, it was almost right at ten dollars a gallon, but uh, you know, so in in our region of the world now, you know, I do this with Rama. I oversee all those areas. I'm not an employee of Rama. I'm kind of an anomaly for what they do. I do it as a partner and not as an employee. So uh, you know, just looking at the figures for over the last couple of years, when we went into COVID, in our area of the world, just in student numbers, we had a about 4,800 students in school every month. We increased about 10 to 12 percent during COVID, and and now in the last year or so, uh, last month we had 7,600 students in school. We've seen a tremendous growth in in the area of student interest and being involved in school. So that's good. So you know I work with a lot of the directors often, and uh, you know we have every <laughs> style, shape, uh, kind of director you can have in all of that. And it's amazing how God works with every different kind of person. But we had this, this one couple that, uh, him more than her, is always just really wanting to voice his, his strong opinion. Well, this was causing a problem in their team. Because if me as a leader, is, if all I ever do is voice my strong opinion, how do you ever get to share anything then? What am I drawing out of you that needs to be drawn out? Well, he wasn't doing that. So uh, one of the other couples that work with them asked if we could all sit down together, and we did. And so we talked about that, and he goes, yeah, I know I do that. I know I do that. And I said, well, what could you do to change that? What, what could you do? He's like, I don't know. I said, well, number one, don't be the first person to talk. If you are going to give an opinion, let your team give theirs first, and then you talk. But I said, how about if you turn those strong opinions into questions and then give those to the team? Would that help? He's like, huh, yeah, probably. So I said, well, let's, let's practice that. And so, you know, over the last year or two, I ask him about it every now and then. I say, how are you doing with that? He goes, I'm getting better. I'm not just speaking up right away, but I'm thinking about what my opinion is and I'm turning it into a question and then asking it. And I said, how has that helped your team? He said, well, they're more engaged. And I said, yeah, and they probably have better ideas than you do too, don't they? He goes, yeah, they do. So that also draws that out. Now, there's nothing wrong with a leader having an opinion and you should have some. Uh, and especially when it comes to direction, that's more than opinion. But uh, when it comes to finding some things out from the team, the only way you're going to do that is if you ask questions. When I was younger working for other ministries, and these were well-known ministries, I never worked at, at Kenneth Hagin Ministries, but I worked at some other places, nobody ever asked what I thought. I had thoughts, and I had good thoughts, at least I thought. <laughs> but nobody ever asked what I thought, and I thought, what a waste. You know, and here's the leader trying to figure it all out, and he didn't have to. We were there to help figure it out. He, he got the final say. He got to say yes or no. 
But why not ask and see? I mean, today, I don't even hardly have to think about that stuff anymore. Everybody's got a good opinion about it, I think, in our teams. You just ask the question, you go, yeah, I like that, that's good. If I'm the one with the best opinion or the best idea, that upsets me. Because <laughs> I think they should, there, there should be out there better ideas. But part of that is, uh, is my job is to help draw that out by asking the right questions. So, um, anyhow, um, it's a skill to hold your opinions to yourself until everyone else has done, uh, uh, does two things, where they are able to speak and give their uh, thoughts about something. And then what it does is it helps you benefit from hearing everything and gives you more time to think. So asking those questions and holding our own opinions is valuable. Um, all right, so let's, let's move on. We must ask questions to others. Uh, that's, that's a great place where discipleship takes place is when we're asking other people questions. Now, let's say you have a friend and uh, they aren't maybe on the track that they should be and you think you want to talk to them and ask questions. What's the risk there? They may not like what you have to say. Has anybody ever lost a relationship by doing that? Yeah, probably we all have. doesn't mean you were wrong in bringing it up. Uh, you know, maybe we could find better ways to do it. And I think that it's less aggressive and intrusive if we ask questions instead of saying, God, you are so far off track. Everybody can see it. <laughs> uh, you know, that probably isn't going to be the way to win them back. So asking questions might help there. Um, we talked about that in Mark 4 with Jesus and his disciples. Um, when we have a, a young lady that works with us, and, and she's German, and uh, she was talking to me one day on uh, WhatsApp, and she was a little upset about her leader and, and something. And she goes, the next time I'm there, I'm going to tell her da 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 I said, you could. I said, and how do you think that will build that relationship? She goes, well, I know, but I said, why don't you ask her some questions and say, why are you this, or is this the reason you're doing this, or what are you thinking with this? I said, do you think that would maybe help open up the conversation more? She's like, yeah, <laughs> I suppose. I said, well, try that, and then let me know how it went. And uh, so she did, and it went much better than if she had just, this is what I think, and you're holding me back, and all that kind of stuff. I said, because we're not in, I said, we're not hold, we don't want to hold anybody back. And if you are, I'm happy that you come to tell me about it, but then let's, I want you to go back and see if you can fix that without me. So when Zach, our oldest, was younger, when he was just a little guy, we had moved to Terre Haute, Indiana, and we were pastoring, and we actually had a parsonage right next to the church. And the house needed work, and we were slowly doing that. But so he's a little guy, and so I, I come downstairs. I had an office in the house still then, and uh, come downstairs, and we had mini blinds. There was a lot of windows all the way around there. And, the, and the, at about, right about here, all the mini blinds had a little cut in them, and they were sagging on one side. So I said, uh, hey, Zach, do you know anything about these mini blinds and how they got cut? And he goes, no. I mean, he was pretty convincing. <laughs> and uh, I said, okay. Well, I know that Michelle didn't do it. She doesn't go around cutting mini blinds, especially right at that height. <laughs> and uh, I knew I didn't do it, and he was the only other one in the house. So I asked him a little later again, I said, so, Zach, um, the mini blinds, you know, they've got a cut and they're all hanging down there. I said, do you know how that happened? No. And I thought, he is lying way too good. This bothers me. So I waited a little while longer, and I sat down with him on the, on the stairs, and I said, hey, Zach, when I asked you about those mini blinds, if you cut them, uh, and you said no, I said, did you have a bad feeling right here? He goes, Yes. <laughs> And I said, 
Well, that's because the Spirit of God in you, you know, was letting you know you weren't, you weren't telling the truth and what you were doing was wrong. And I said, you know, you're forgiven for cutting the mini blinds, but you will get disciplined for lying. So, you know, we still had to deal with that. But it, I never really had to do anything but ask him questions with that to, to get the truth out and to help him. To where, and he remembers that to this day. So then with the kids, you know, like Gabby, she, she was, oh, she's how old is she now? 25 now. And going to have a baby next month. And, uh, but when she was 14, um, she says one day, she goes, Dad, you want to go for a walk? And our house in Germany backed up to a really nice forest. And so we just had to walk out the door about 100 yards and we were in the forest. And so I said, sure, give me a few minutes. Let me finish something here. Let's go. And uh, so we started walking out there and I just got a little ways into the forest. And I said, so what do you want to talk about? She goes, how do you know I want to talk about something? I said, I'm your dad. I know everything about you. And you want to keep kids thinking that as long as possible. Uh, <laughs> So she goes, Dad. And uh, I, I said, well, what did you want to talk about? She goes, well, what would you say if a boy asked me out on a date? She's 14. My opinion is very strong about that. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I guess I just would like to know where he'd least like to be shot. <laughs> She's like, Dad. And uh, so we, we walked for about 45 minutes, and uh, I said, well, Gabby, what does a date mean to you? Yeah. And boy, am I glad I asked that question. Because her idea of a date was right here. Mine was right there. We were not on the same page at all. So if I'd come against her hard about, you know, no way, and boy, this is going to happen at this age, and, which it wasn't, uh, you know, she would have just been going like, well, what's wrong with him? Because she, she wasn't thinking the same way I was at all. So we walked through that, and I said, well, what does it mean to you? And she told me what it meant to her, and I said, well, okay. I said, would you do this with just, just a guy or with a group? She goes, well, I don't know. I guess we could do it with either. And uh, you could tell she hadn't thought much about this at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but she's just getting old enough where guys are getting interested, and you know, so that whole thing's happening, but there's not much background there for her, obviously. So... Uh, said, well, then would you, would you ever be alone, you know, after whatever you were doing? She goes, I don't know, maybe. I said, would the lights be out? <laughs> she goes, why would the lights be out? <laughs> That's how innocent she was yet. And uh, I said, well, you know, there's reasons. And uh, <laughs> so we, we talked about it a little bit longer. And so probably at about... 30, 35 minutes into the walk, she says, you know, I think I'm probably not ready to date yet. <laughs> I had never given an opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Only questions. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, and on the inside, I'm going, yes, 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 yes. But I just said, that's probably a good decision right now. So then I, I did say, Gabby, you know, I said, I've never been a 14-year-old girl, which today you can change that. Uh, <laughs> And I've never been a 16-year-old girl, but I said I have been a 14-year-old boy and I've been a 16-year-old boy, and I know what that's like. I said, there's something in a guy, and I said, now you might meet guys that are better than I was at the time, but uh, I said, there's something in us that wants to conquer. And I said, that means that's you. They want to conquer you, and I said, do you know what that means? She goes, no. So I told her exactly what it meant. And she's like, God, Dad, you're so gross. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm glad you think so at this point in time. But I said, just so you know, that's, that's where some guys' minds are at when they ask you out on a date. You're thinking all this nice, friendly stuff, maybe go to a movie and have something to eat, and he's way beyond that. I said, maybe not with everybody, but I said, there's, just, there's hormones working, and it's a different thing, so you have to be ready for that. So anyhow, we made it through that one okay. And <laughs> uh, but I was, I was so happy about it afterwards because it w I didn't ever have to give my opinion. Yeah. And, and what a mistake it would have been in that case if I'd have done that. 
So it, it, it works asking questions, and especially with different personalities of our kids. She, Gabby was always better when she could self-discover instead of being told. Because if you said um, it's black, she said, no, it's white when she was younger. She was just that kind of kid for a while, and it took, uh, you know, you had to let her figure some of those things out. So Spencer then, when uh, he's our middle one, he's 26 or 7 now, and when he was in uh, the junior high age, you know, they were, and he was at an international school, it was quite liberal, and the, they were in one of their classes, they're doing um, the theory of evolution, but they're not teaching it as a theory. So he had done extensive study on YouTube on creation versus evolution. So in class, he just kept asking questions. To where finally, even, you know, he had like two kids in his class who were Christians, the rest weren't. But it didn't take very long, and none of the kids believed in evolution anymore. And it was all because he just kept asking questions, and he was backing the teacher into a corner, and the teacher didn't know what to say. So finally the teacher says, Spencer, you are not allowed to ask questions any longer. Well, that's good teaching right there, isn't it? But by then he'd already won the class over, and they didn't believe in evolution because it didn't make any sense. Based on the, and he did it all with questions. So this kind of thing that, um, you know, whether we're asking ourselves or others questions, it makes a big difference. Um, I think I might have shared this here in the past, and I'll probably finish with this. Uh, I've spent a lot, a lot of time on airplanes over the years. I mean, with all my traveling that I did. And nowadays, everybody's got the universal headphone thing, I don't want to talk to you. Okay, so this is, doesn't work the way it used to, but nobody had headphones in the old days. When I first started flying, we actually had a plug-in tube that went you know, in, into the arm and then up into your ears. It was like talking on a can from, with a string in it. But it, that's, it was literally that. There was sound and it came up through the tubes. That's, yeah, I used to be flying. That's the same time when people used to smoke on airplanes. So I'm glad both of those are gone. So, uh, you know, there was a time then when, uh, you know, you, you actually talk to people on the airplane. And because of what I did, lots of times if people would ask what I did and I said, it would stop conversations. And, or it became an eight-hour counseling session because like, wow, I got a pastor next to me? I got some issues. I can talk about them for eight hours. <laughs> you know, and you'd get off plane, you had your head that way the whole time. You're just like, oh, turning it back. But in most cases, that wasn't it. And so you'd, you'd, you'd talk to people, and I learned that if I could just ask them question after question after question before they ever asked me what I did, by the time they did, usually it was softened a little bit. Because what happens when somebody's asking you questions? It shows they're interested, right? They care, maybe. So uh, in those cases, then when somebody finally got around saying, well, what do you do? And I had a lot of different answers for that. I would say I'm a builder. What do you build? I build churches. Really? Where? All over the world. And uh, or I, you know, every now and then I'd say a pastor or a missionary. And, and every, sometimes when you'd say that, you could just feel this wall go, be built up right between you. So what do you do about that? Well, what I learned was to ask another question. And said, I would just say, hey, when I said that, it kind of felt like a wall went up between us. And have you had a bad experience with the church or with Christians? 100% of the time, they said, yes. So then what do you do? You say, well, tell me about it. You know, I'm only going to hear their side of it anyhow. It doesn't matter whether it's true or false. But you know, they hear they'd had a bad experience with the church or with Christians, and somebody's asking them, what is that? And they always told me. They always shared that with me. And usually I just say at the end, I said, well, that's unfortunate. I said, that's not the way it's supposed to work. And, you know, then we'd talk a little bit more. And my goal was at least they found one Christian they liked by the time they got off the airplane. Yes. And sometimes I, le I led a few people to Christ on the airplanes, got really close with some, but didn't get all the way there. Uh, you know, at least prayed with people, you know, to, to even if they weren't saved, I'd, if, they, if they'd let me pray with them, I would. Uh, and that was a long way from where I started out being afraid to ask a girl out on a date. 
right? Then it was all because I just learned the trick or the art of asking questions and how that could change my life and how that could change theirs. Let's go ahead and stand up this morning. I didn't finish, but that'll be good enough. Had a lot of other good scriptures. So I do have a question for you this morning, at least one. Um, I like what Pastor Nate said. I'd never heard that before. How did you say that about if you give God enough time, to ample time? What was that saying? Yeah, give, give him ample opportunity to show you why he brought you. That's a great saying. Because then you, you, at least you have to be asking the question, God, why did you bring me? And there is a reason why, you know, if you've never been here before, this isn't the pond I normally fish in, so I don't know everybody. And uh, so there is a reason why he brought you, whether a friend invited you or whether you just, it just seemed like you should come, whatever it was. And the first step in that is that he would like, God would like to have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. That, you know, when I was, before I was born again, People shared the gospel with me in all sorts of different ways. And they finally said that Jesus would change my life because they had changed theirs. And I share that often too. I said that Jesus changed my life and he'll change yours. Give him an opportunity to show you that. When I, the prayer that I prayed for salvation was, God, I'll give you my life if you're big enough to change it. If you aren't, this will be a short experiment. So is that the one that everybody teaches us? No, but nobody taught me one. That was my prayer. So, but do you think God got nervous with that? Not at all. He didn't get nervous with it. it would just You ask God to prove himself to you, he'll do it, right? God, if you're not big enough to change my life, this is going to be a short experiment. So I would, I would ask you today, are you willing to do that too? Say, God, I'll give you my life if you can change it. And if not, well, give it 30 days and you can say, forget it. But I guarantee you that that will not be the case. So is there anybody here this morning that said, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to pray the prayer, give my life to Jesus and have him change it for me, with me. Let me see one hand over here. Thank you. And you you got to be brave, Right? Sometimes you're in a group you're not familiar with and to raise your hand is a big deal. But I can tell you this, that everybody here, I mean, I know most people here have made that decision. And so at one time or another, they did something similar. So um, anybody else? Otherwise, I'm going to invite this young man up here for a moment. You want to come up here? You guys probably have a prayer team that'll do something with him, but I am John. Nice to meet you. Glad you came today. First time here? No? No? Well, good. You gave him ample time. You came back. Good on that. Well, let's... Uh, so you've probably heard some things from being here before, and you're just ready to make that decision today, huh? Good. Well, let's just grab hands, and if you'll just pray after me. Say, Father God, I come to you today in Jesus' name, and I give you my life. I want, I want my life to change and I want you to be a part of it. And Father, I'm so thankful that you brought me here today and before because I can see how much you love me. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thanks so much. Do they have a probably a prayer team or somebody that'll pray with you? Or you got it? okay, good. Well, other than that, I will say thank you guys for today. Um, I, I always enjoy being here, and I, I hope that that helped you in one way or another. That uh, you'll you'll leave here thinking about some things that you can ask. I would I would oh, I, if I was going to give you homework, I'd say this: um, go home and either whether you do it on your phone or your computer or a piece of paper, write down some questions that you should ask yourself, that you should ask others, 
You know, it's, and the others is a, is a whole lot of things. I mean, it could be somebody above you have questions about your kids that you might want to ask a question. And, and, never, and try to never ask yes and no questions, right? Always something that somebody has to think about and give a little bit deeper answer than yes or no. And you'll make the mistake, if, you, if you're not used to doing it, of asking too many of those, uh, but you'll get better at it. It's just like anything else, you gotta practice. So, and then write down, you know, some questions you would ask your teams, maybe the people at work, um, saved or unsaved. And then some questions you wanna ask God. And you'd be amazing, uh, give him a little bit of time to give you some answers back and the answers that he will, what's the word I want? Put in your spirit, right? Sometimes it's really direct, other times it, you have to piece it together. After the hike this summer, I had to piece some things together over a couple of months. But uh, because there was some, just some things that had, you know, I felt like he was wanting me to get or to say or to, to understand, and, but it, it didn't all come at once. I talked to Michelle about a lot of it afterwards and then talked to the kids about some of it at Christmas. And so what do we want the next 20 years to look like? And it wasn't taking anything away from what we were doing, but it was actually adding to. That's how God, it's funny how God is. You can think about slowing down and all this kind of stuff, and that was not what he was thinking <laughs> at all. That's because I'm thinking, what about the next couple of years? And he goes, what do you want the next 20 years to look like? Well, I'm thinking, okay, I got some ideas about that. So anyhow, we're, we're sifting through some of those now. But anyhow... Let me pray for you guys, and then we'll go. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for beyond. Thank you that they are reaching the world, that their, their, uh, their reach goes way beyond here so that other people will know the Lord Jesus Christ also. Father, I thank you, Lord, that as, as you're working in and through them, that they are a greater blessing to this community and beyond than they have ever been before. And Father, thank you for filling them with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.